Every year, I try to take on something new. This year, I decided to take on surfing here in Barcelona. You see, when you take your first surfing lesson, one of the things you learn first is that it's all about timing. If you're able to time your ride with that next wave, you're going to feel how it lifts you up, it carries you forward, and it takes you way into the next wave. But if you don't get your timing right, you're likely to end up like this. You're going to end up washed over by a wave. You're going to end up feeling the cold of your body hitting the water, and perhaps even tasting salt up your nose. And what's even worse, if you're able to get your head above the water, you're going to end up feeling a very, very horrible, miserable feeling by watching everyone else surf away. But we're not here to talk about surfing, luckily. We're here to talk about online influence. So let me talk about that. You see, we've had the internet for over three decades almost now. We've had social media for over a decade. And one of the magical things that's happened because of that is that a number of individuals, regular people, have been able to reach hundreds or thousands of people, more people that you can reach perhaps with a TV show, a radio show, or even newspapers and magazines. Isn't that amazing? Now, I'm not talking about people like Donald Trump, Taylor Swift, or Ashton Kutcher. No, these people have actually taken advantage of that media to benefit themselves, and that's not fair. No, I'm talking about people like Kayla, Zoe, or Grace, who have been named top influencers by Forbes magazine. The question is why? Why them and not you? Why? Why, if they have access to the same social networks, the same tools, the same instruments, why do these three women have over 55 million followers combined on social media? And not just that, by the way, because that number keeps growing. Think about this. By the end of this talk, these three people will have gained more followers than the size of this room combined times three. That's not fair, right? There's definitely something going on here. What is it? What do they have that you don't have? And more importantly, what would you do with millions of followers? Have you thought about that? Well, I have thought about that. In fact, I've spent my whole career developing online audiences for superstars and consumer brands. But what I really, really enjoy is doing that exact same thing for up-and-coming artists and startups. And not long ago, I made a very, very special discovery. It's a discovery so profound that it changed the way in which I look at online influence. In fact, it changed the way that I operate on social media. And as a result of that, I went from 4,000 followers on Twitter to over 100,000 in just two years. How? Well, if you take a look at what great influencers do, you realize they're all pretty much doing the same thing. In fact, what's interesting is that it's exactly the opposite of what everyone else is doing. You know, they think, act, and operate exactly the same way, but not as you would expect. You see, because people, most people, they want to put themselves up on a pedestal and expect their followers to look up to them. But what great influencers do is they put their audience up on a pedestal and they look up to them. You realize that? Here's the insight. People don't follow you because of who you are. People follow you because of who they are. In other words, it's not about you, it's about them. Now, if you realize that, you're probably thinking, hmm, you know, that's probably not what I expected, right? You know, I would expect it to be the other way around. And more importantly, if you realize that, you realize that perhaps your biggest obstacle towards your online influence may actually be you. So here, today, what I want to do is encourage you to do three things that will help you overcome that challenge. I'm talking about these three things. I'm talking about thanks, praise, and generosity. Because remember, it's not about you, it's about them. Why thanks? Because when you are appreciating something, when you are thanking someone, you're, you're focusing on that someone or that thing, so you can't simultaneously focus on you. Because it's not about you, it's about them. 
praise works much the same way. When you're recognizing something great that someone else has done, again, you're building trust. And trust is the glue that keeps your followers together. Because it's not about you, it's about them. And last but not least, generosity, giving, ideas, thought, content, connections. When you're doing that, you're realizing it's not about you, it's about them. Now let me illustrate that with a story. I'm going to tell you the tale of the two seas. This is the story about two seas that lay very close to each other in the map. But one of them, the Sea of Galilee, is actually full of life. It's got fish and vegetation. It's full of greatness and life. But the other one, the Dead Sea, is actually a lifeless, dark body of water. What's interesting is that these two seas are both fed by the same river. It's the Jordan River. But the difference is this. In the case of the Sea of Galilee, water flows in and it flows out. In the case of the Dead Sea, water only flows in. So if you are the kind of person that is always taking in inspiration, thoughts, ideas, and then projecting all of that back to everyone else, well, then you're going to be full of life, like the Sea of Galilee. But if you're the kind of person that's only taking in, taking in, taking in, well, you can guess what that is. Now, if you want to do this for yourselves, you want to grow your online influence, one of the best things you can do is actually talk to people that have done this before. And that's exactly what I did just a few weeks ago when I sat down with Maria Jose Cayuela. Maria Jose Cayuela is one of the biggest influencers in Spain for motherhood and families. And you know what I learned from her? She's here, by the way, sitting in the audience. What I learned from her is that when you sit in front of Maria Jose and you look into her eyes as she talks about her work, she never uses the word audience or followers, no. She always uses the word community. Because in fact, what she's doing is building a community of people. Remember, it's not about you, it's about them. So, if we know it's about communities, why don't we look at how communities actually develop? Well, I'm ready to tell you how that works too. For that, I'm going to use what's called the innovation adoption cycle. You may have seen it before, you can find this on the internet. But what it says is that when a community or an innovation takes place, it always starts with the innovators, the early adopters. And that is a small group of people, the small group of people that's brave enough to embrace something new. They don't care what everyone else thinks. They just care to discover that new thing. And then the early majority joins. Another larger group of people, this is where the numbers come in, by the way. This is where you see hundreds or thousands of followers and people start taking notice. And that number of people gets doubled by the late majority, then followed by the laggards. The laggards are the people that just don't want to be left behind. Do you realize what's happening here? It's not about you, it's about them. Each one of these groups is actually following the group before it. So they're not following you, they're following each other. It's not about you, it's about them. Now, don't just take my word for it. Just look at what happened here on this stage when I walked up. Did you notice the welcome I got? I was actually playing an experiment on you. Because I asked some of my most loyal followers to come here in person and give me the warmest welcome they could, and they did. And I'm sure you noticed that. And if you did, I'm pretty sure that shaped your opinion and your thoughts and your expectations about this talk. Because again, it's not about you, it's about them. And they're not following me. They're following you. So if you could, please stand up if you participated in this, and let's give them a big round of applause and recognize them for a great job that they've done. Thank you very much. And I want to thank you all for doing that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, so now, I haven't told you any secrets yet, right? I mean, I came here to tell you a secret. Everything I've told you so far, you can find out on the internet. In fact, you can find it in this book. How to Win Friends and Influence People by the great Dale Carnegie. This book was written in 1936, people. So, again, nothing new. But I do have a secret for you. Do you want to know what that secret is? You do want to know that secret, right? Well, let me tell you that secret, but before I have to tell you one more thing about how communities actually develop. And that's what's called the 1% rule. The 1% rule states that out of 100 people in a community, only 1% will be those givers, the ones that are providing, publishing, adding content. 
The other 99 are likely to just be sharing that information or just taking it in. Sound familiar? Now, the reason for that is I'm sure you've experienced all that. If you've ever had a problem with your computer and you go online and you search for a solution, if you find an answer, now you know that at least there have been 100 people that have had that same problem, found the solution, and at least one of them has shared it. You see what I'm talking about? All right, so let's think that perhaps we're in a, in the case of Twitter. Let's say we have Twitter, right? And uh, we have 100 people signed up on Twitter, the very early days of Twitter. If that was the case, we would have one giver, in this case, Zineb, also in the audience, let's use her as an example, and 99 takers. And that would be just fine, right? Because if Zineb's the only one publishing, everyone else would get to see everything she's publishing. But as the network gets bigger and bigger, let's say it goes up three times and it becomes 300 people. Well, now probably would have Sandra and Monica uh, also giving the givers, also here in the audience, by the way. Um, and then we'd have 297 other people just taking it in. Now, if there's only three givers, it's no problem, right? All those 297 could still see everything that Monica, Sandra, or Zineb are publishing. But guess what happens if Twitter gets bigger and bigger and bigger? What's going to happen is that it's actually going to follow the exact curve we talked about, right? The adoption curve. And so instead of the early innovators and early, uh, um, early adopters, like it would be with the case that we, we talked about, we now would have more people joining. Now think about this. Let's say you are one of those givers that joins later, maybe perhaps part of the early majority, right? Well, now you and the people that join would face a little problem. If now Twitter's gotten bigger and bigger and there's a lot more givers, now your limited attention span will have to be spread between a lot of givers. So you will have to choose who to follow. And that's no problem if you follow what I said before. If you practice thanks, praise, and generosity, you're likely to stand out and so you'll have more followers than everyone else. And up to here is fine. But what if you are joining now as an early majority or maybe even the late majority? In other words, when Twitter's been around for a while, what's going to happen? What's going to happen is that as you join and do everything right, just like I told you, you're now competing with the people that have been at it for much longer than you. So now you're at a small disadvantage, aren't you? So you join, you're a giver, with you, there's going to be another 99 takers that are joining at the same time. And now think about this and answer this question. If you are one of those takers joining in, and you're faced with the choice of following someone like Zineb, that by that time would probably have hundreds or thousands of followers, or following you, that person that just joined and then barely has a few friends following, who do you think you're going to end up following? And that's right. That's the exact same reason we pick the busy restaurant on Main Street instead of the empty one next door that might be just as good. It's human nature. Now, do you see the secret? Do you realize? The secret about online influence is timing. Sound familiar? Just like surfing. If you're able to time doing everything right with the wave that represents the platform, the social network, the environment that you're in, then you're going to benefit from all that growth that comes with the development of the actual community. Now, don't take my word for it. Just look at the facts. Let me show you and let me prove it to you by looking at the examples that we talked about before. This chart right here is showing you Google searches for the word Facebook. And what that works for us, what that's good for us is that it's a proxy of the development of the popularity of Facebook, right? If more people are searching for Facebook, it's likely that Facebook is growing. This is not Facebook's numbers. This is Google's numbers, by the way. Now, when do you think Kayla, whose largest part of the community comes from Facebook, when do you think that she started on Facebook? I see it in your faces and you're guessing it right, right here which is exactly the same thing that happened with Zoe on YouTube or Grace with blogging. Can you see that? These people have been doing everything right, but much longer, and they've been able to take that wave of Facebook, YouTube, or blogging and ride it all the way into online influence. Now you're going to be thinking, well, if I want to have massive online influence in places like Twitter or Facebook or YouTube or blogging, it may already be too late. Well, you're probably right about that. 
But like every good surfer knows, there's always the next wave. So, what do you think is that wave going to be? Do you think it's Instagram? Maybe it's Periscope? Maybe it's Snapchat? Podcasting? The truth is, I don't know. But when you see that wave, you will know it. And when you do, remember, it's not about you, it's about them. And you need to practice thanks. Thank every new follower you get in that network. Give them praise. Recognize them for everything that they do right. Even recognize the people that are not your followers. And of course, be generous. Day in and day out. Provide content. No matter what it takes, do it. Because if you do that and you get your timing right, you will be lifted by that wave, you will be carried forward, and you'll be able to surf your way into online influence. And now that I've given you my secret for online influence, there's only two more things I have for you here. One of them is praise you for being such a great audience, and obviously thank you for the gift of your attention. <laughs>